All right, slap tear treatment. So uh, nothing's changed, I think, in my practice more than the treatment of slap tears in baseball players. Who gets the operation and what type of operation and what the non-operative treatment strategies we have. This is what it looks like with some data that we produced on the increase in a number of slap repairs that have happened over time. This increase is astronomical. It's more than other operations because once we learn how to diagnose it and we know it's torn, there's an enthusiasm about fixing it. But like many things that we do, we start to learn what the negative effects are with techniques and we try to get better. So I'm gonna walk you through how this evolved uh, during my career. This is what we did when I was a fellow. This is how we learned how to take care of a slap lesion. You put in a mechanical device, this particular implant. It was made of polyglycolic acid. It rigidly fixed the labrum in place, but this material would degrade so quickly that it would often come loose, not allow the labrum to heal, and because it had degraded so quickly, it would cause inflammation in the shoulder. Here you can see it dislodged on an MRI scan. It looks really funny because there's so much inflammation related to how fast this is degradating. And that's not to say what's happening to this implant against the humeral head. So this is what we did on the left, and then it evolved to suture anchor repair, a different type of mechanical way of fixing the labrum, and so it would potentially be a better repair. Now on the left, you see a mattress repair. That has this, what's often referred to as a meniscoid type appearance. It overlies the glenoid a little bit, and you could put in anchors like that, or if you have a more round labrum that's detached, you can do it as a simple style, which is on the right. And you can see this is early on in, in my career, way over constraining the biceps, and we'll see how that's changed uh, with time. Additional, when we were first doing these repairs, we had to put a giant cannula through the rotator cuff to get access posterior to the biceps. This is a very large cannula, coined a Wilmington portal, and then this patient walked into my office, infielder, had a slap repair, could not get better after his repair, and when we did uh, imaging and repeat arthroscopy, this is a hole in his rotator cuff that we made from the cannula. We had to do a rotator cuff repair on a hole that we made. This is what it looks like in the literature. This is, I'll summarize it, about 60 patients had some testing done. After a hole was made in the rotator cuff, 10% of them had a problem with their rotator cuff. This is another study that looked at a technique where you didn't make a hole in the rotator cuff. The ones who had the hole in the rotator cuff had significant issues, including pain at night, weakness and other things that didn't affect, allow them to return back to play. So how do we get better than making a hole in the rotator cuff? This is my chairman who hired me, it's his tennis partner. He got a rotator cuff tear. We're gonna fix his rotator cuff tear, he's a little older. And then I see this very unstable slap and he's not consented for tenodesis and slap repair and things and uh, just couldn't let it go because I felt with all this rotator cuff healing, he, we had an opportunity to make his shoulder better. So we percutaneously put in an implant and you can see the small hole that's made in the rotator cuff, very medial, so it's not even through the rotator cuff tendon. And then we can pass sutures and we develop this technique of tying behind the biceps, big cannulates in the rotator interval. And we can do repairs in this way and it looked like something that was beneficial. No more big holes in the rotator cuff. Good success rate, this does not include all throwers. We're gonna talk more about throwers specifically. And then we became to understand normal anatomy. That blue arrow looks like it could be a tear. That thing's not attached to the glenoid. The thing on top of the, of the probe and the blue can, or the uh, gray cannula, that's the biceps tendon, we know what that is. But that thing with the star, that's a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament and the hole that you see there in the front is a normal hole that we call a foramen. In the beginning, we didn't know that was normal, so we would repair it and that would restrict external rotation. And for a thrower, that was devastating and would limit their ability to throw and throw well. And then we learned not just that these holes were normal, don't fix those, that there's probably some adaptive qualities to the shoulder that are normal. When somebody has this external rotation, there is definite bone 
geometry that's responsible for this, but there's also some soft tissue changes that allow for this to happen. And some of those are partial thickness rotator cuff tears, and some of them are labral tears. Here's a study out of Miami, and basically 50% of their major league pitchers on an MRI scan who have no symptoms have a slap tear. So they don't hurt and they have a slap tear. They're established pitchers. That tends to tell us it's normal. So how are we gonna differ a normal slap from one that's not normal? John Conway came up with this, some are good and some are bad. The good one is purposeful. It allows for greater labral mobility, more motion, that allows for velocity and performance. Those, if you see it on MRI scan, of course you ignore, or if necessary, you just debride it, you clean it up. The bad one is pathologic, which causes too much translation, the shoulder becomes too unstable, and they have pain and they have issues with performance. And those are the ones that we're either gonna fix, and we're gonna hear about this biceps tenodesis as an option. So, how do we tell the difference? Well, it's hard, and we're evolving, and this is what we're gonna continue to learn more about. A good one has relatively good tissue. It's smooth, it's compensated. This is a shoulder being positioned and the cocking phase of throwing while they have the camera inside. And you can see that posterior superior labrum has some mobility. That's normal, that's not unstable. That doesn't have to be fixed. That one's going to do well. These are bad ones. If the biceps anchor becomes unstable, that's gonna cause pain. Look at the biceps on the bottom when you go into external rotation. It's moving at its attachment site. That's the one that's gonna be problematic. That's the one that likely needs to be fixed. So now we're being selective and we're getting an idea of which ones should be repaired. Now let's talk about some morbidity because with this enthusiasm of fixing labrums, we've seen some more bad things. This kid came into my office. He was a collegiate baseball player. He had two slap repairs. And then he said, I cannot study in class because my shoulder is killing me and I can't even carry my books. All he wanted was pain relief, not even to get back to throwing. And we see this thing, not, not picked up by the radiologist, but when you see it on three views, something in the middle of his glenoid, that was concerning. We put the camera inside. This is the uh, biceps in front of it. That is suture anchor material that was put inside the shoulder. And look at the groove it's making in the humeral head. That is cartilage that we can never repair that's getting a railroad track made right in the middle of it. And that's part of his problem and it's related to the surgery that was done. And then the anchor came loose and got stuck in the middle of his glenoid and that's what the MRI scan was from. And we simply took out all this material just hoping he would get pain relief and he got back to throwing. So we basically undid the two surgeries that he had and he got back to throwing. And this is an isolated case I used to see this more frequently, but now that we've evolved techniques, it's uh, less commonly. And then we said, well, if we're putting anchor material and it's gonna groove the humeral head and cause cartilage problems, we might as well tie the knots further away from the articular margin. So we had this concept, get the knots away from the cartilage and that'll be better. So we thought this was a good looking labor repair at the time. But then we got this new technology and it's knotless and this is what is state of the art now. I'll give you an example. He's 17, he's got pain and he's failed non-operative treatment and he elects surgery and we clean up some of his labrum and now that we can put in material to fix it and not over constrain the biceps, we can fix this in a more, call it good form of a normal labrum and not have knots that can be a problem. This is what it looks like in, uh, in in real time with some editing. Here's a preparation. We want to stimulate the attachment site to heal. So we basically abrade the bone and then percutaneously stay away from big holes in the rotator cuff. We can pass suture material through the labrum. And when we do it close to the biceps, we don't even grab all of the labrum, we grab parts of it so that when it's finally fixed, there's still some biceps mobility. Because if we over constrain the biceps, that's gonna be a cause of pain. And we know with the massive external rotation, their biceps is gonna be moving. So we can use these shuttling techniques and we pass in the newest and latest material. It's not even a round suture, it's a tape. So it can lie even flatter. It's extremely strong, has high frictional uh, component to it and features to it. So when it gets fixed, 
the fixation is really strong. And as we move further down and away from the biceps, we can get more aggressive with taking more labral tissue. So here's passing through the labrum, we do our shuttling technique, and now we pass another suture tape, which it's referred to. And now, percutaneously again, we can make drill holes for where we want to fix this. And we're making the drill holes a little bit on the margin of the glenoid so we can get what we would consider an anatomic repair. And then we put in this implant and it's going to fix this tape so that we don't have to tie any knots. So there's nothing proud or going to irritate either the rotator cuff or the humeral head cartilage. Okay, and, and we can talk and debate with some of the cases on whether we should fix anterior to the biceps, more on how much tissue you take, and we're gonna get lots of thoughts from uh, Kevin on how we can rehab these. So here's uh, sobering, this is 2014, Dave Lintner, Houston. 21 pitchers were treated non-operatively. Their return to plate with a slap tear was 40%. And return to performance, that is they're the same pitcher as before they got symptomatic, was only 22%, that's dismal. So non-operative doesn't work, well we should operate on them. Those that were treated with surgery, only 48% return to that level of play or return to play, and then only 7% return to the same level of performance. Clearly there's something that's not great. This data does not reflect the most up-to-date strategies for indication for surgery and also what the repair strategies. So we need to get better. How are we gonna get better? Well, we need to diagnose the source of pain accurately. We used to see a slap tear, we used to repair it. Not all need to be fixed. And that's understanding the good slap from the bad slap and using these updated new surgical techniques. And we're gonna hear more about this option of biceps tenodesis. Thank you. <laughs>